Um, okay, good morning everyone. Hi and welcome to my talk, The Front End Taboo, a, full st a story of full stack microservices or how we harvest the benefits of microservices in the front end. My name is Moritz and I sell shoes for a living. Well, not directly, but if I do my job well, I hopefully sell shoes for a living. I'm a software engineer at Zalando. Who here has ever heard of Zalando? Ooh, wow, more than I expected. Um, we don't officially ship anything here, so I guess all of you who haven't heard about it, that might change if in the future, but Zalando is actually one of Europe's biggest online fashion retailers. We run an online fashion store website that uh, sells to over a dozen countries in Europe, to over a dozen languages, and this fashion shop is where I actually work. And um, I think I have to tell you a little bit about Zalando so that you can put my talk into scope, into context. Zalando is more than just an online shop. We also run our own warehouses, we create our own fashion labels, we even run a few brick and mortar stores. Uh, we have mobile apps, not only for the fashion store, but we constantly try to innovate new ventures that, um, that experiment with creative ideas around fashion. We aim to become, for our customers and for our suppliers, the one-stop solution for everything related to fashion. And to achieve that, we first and foremost are a tech company. And, well, as a tech company, sometimes we do crazy things, like uh, we put a shoe into space just because we can. We wanted to see if we can and we achieved. This is an actual picture. This is not a Photoshop or anything. Um, we put a shoe into the stratosphere. We recovered that shoe later, and we even recovered the camera that is attached to that thing. Um, all of this just to say Zalando is a huge company. We currently make over 3 billion euros in revenue per year. We have over 135 million uh, visitors per month. Our fashion store alone, the fashion store where I work, peaks at over 7,000 requests per second on a good day. We have over 15 million, 50 million active customers. And at Zalando we employ over 10,000 people and more than 12,000 of those work in tech alone. We have tech hubs all over Europe, so we are a distributed company. I work in Berlin, I have colleagues in Helsinki, in Dublin, we constantly open more tech hubs, and this is not even the end. Zalando is still on a growing path, we still want to expand, we still want to become bigger, we still want to ship here to uh, Serbia, I mean. We still want to, to grow, and for that we believe that we have to become the most magnetic employer in tech. But, well, enough advertisement, you didn't come here to learn about Zalando, you came here to learn about what we do with microservices, I guess. But the scope of our our operations kind of influences the solutions that we arrived at. And due to our sheer size, we face some challenges on our day-to-day -day life. So, I mean, you surely can imagine a company this big has a code base that is of similar size. And huge code bases, huge legacy code bases, usually huge legacy monolith code bases, they come with their own challenges. They, they have effects on productivity. A huge code base has lots of dependencies, technical dependencies, but also non-technical dependencies between teams. We have dependencies inside of the company. We have dependencies on third-party libraries, sometimes in very specific versions. So every change we do to our code base requires coordination, huge amount of coordination. And coordination takes time. And in the end, somehow the law of diminishing returns that really hits us hard. The more time we invest, the more resources we invest, the more developer hours we invest, we're not getting a linear return on investment on that thing. The, the curve flattens a little bit just because of the size of huge code bases. But that is not the only disadvantage of a huge code base. Um, I mean, this is not the first talk about microservices at this company. So you all know huge code bases also have an impact on innovation. Um, you, you all know small, nimble companies, the small startups, the competitors, they sometimes run circles around the big companies. Big companies are slow, they, they move slowly. And that is because innovation and change in a big code base is really hard to achieve. I mean, for one thing, huge code bases usually also have tons of bugs. There are studies that show there is, there is more or less a linear correlation between lines of code and bugs. So the more lines of code you have, the more bugs you have. And Worst of all, sometimes those bugs are kind of side effects that other parts of the system rely on. So you have this kind of butterfly effect. You fix a small bug on that side of your system and something completely or seemingly completely unrelated breaks on the other side of the system. Who here has ever had that? Fixing a bug, breaking something else, be honest, I did it multiple times. Um, well, so we somehow have to deal with that. We still have to put new features in, we still have to fix bugs. 
and that without breaking something that can usually only be achieved with rigid processes. Processes like strict code review, long acceptance tests, detailed specifications for every change. And when you have those rigid processes, it's really hard to innovate. There, innovation takes time and you have this constant resistance that you have to innovate against. And then, of course, growth. I mean, what I'm currently telling you probably doesn't sound like a company you want to work at. So it's hard to hire. Onboarding is slow. Huge code base has to be learned. Huge code bases are also often built on, well, let's call it a well-established tech stack to, to not offend someone. And those well-established tech stacks, they are usually not so interesting to the motivated people. Motivated developers want to work with the newest, with the coolest technology. So when you have not the newest and coolest technology, you are less magnetic. It's harder to hire good people. So I think I'm not telling you anything new when I explain to you huge code bases are problems for organizations. Has anyone ever heard of Conway's law? Cool. About as much as I've heard about Zalando. <laughs> Conway's law states that organizations that design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of those organizations. So big, complicated organizations produce big, complicated systems. It's not a law, but it surprisingly often holds. So we at Zalando, we tried something radical. To get away from our legacy code base, from our monolith, we hacked our organization in the hopes that our systems will follow. So. About two years ago, or one and a half year ago, our VP of engineering, Eric Bowman, announced radical agility to us and to the world. And radical agility is not only buzzword bingo, but it is also a radical restructuring of how we run our tech. And that we hope we do that in the hopes to use Conway's law to our advantage, not to our disadvantage. We want autonomous teams that deliver amazing products efficiently and at scale. We believe that this is the only way that we can grow in a scaling way and achieve what we want to achieve. So we've created a culture, we've created an organization that values trust over control. And similar to a microservice architecture, our organization created small focused teams that all have a clear purpose. It's easy to spawn up new teams when a new purpose arises. Those teams move autonomously, they're encouraged to achieve excellence, to achieve mastery, they can choose their own tech stacks, and yeah, basically they are like small independent microservices in an organizational way. So to quickly summarize, we've created a purpose-driven organization and we are in the process of migrating to a service-oriented architecture composed of loosely coupled independent microservices. And all is good in the world, right? I mean, we all developed happily ever after, or not? All those, all those promises of microservices, all those loosely coupled teams, there is a taboo that most people don't really talk about and also at conferences that people don't often talk about. And that is what we like to call the front-end taboo. How does all those microservice glory, all those independent work, all those autonomy, how does that apply to the front-end? Can front-end developers, I mean, those are the, the common promises that microservices give you, or some of them, I guess. It's different whoever you ask. But microservices promise you to work autonomously. They promise you a mix of different technology stacks. They promise you independent release cycles. Let's look at those promises from the perspective of a real front-end developer. Typical systems use APIs. Typical Microsoft system, uh, mi sorry, not Microsoft, microservice systems use APIs. Every API is their own microservice. Some teams have more, some teams have less. They can all do whatever they want. They can all make their stakeholders happy. But the best APIs are generally useless to the customer if there is not a front-end with a great user experience in front of it. I mean, who here buys shoes by making a curl call to a JSON API? I guess I would, but um, probably our wives and girlfriends would not. So we need a front-end with a great user experience that is usable by normal people. And someone has to build this front-end. And unless we want that front-end to look like a complete patchwork, to look like it was designed by hundreds of different teams that don't really communicate with each other, we have a problem. And most companies solve that problem by still having a front-end monolith. A front-end monolith where multiple teams contribute to. So the front-end, people all work on the same code base. And even if you're a big company, you probably have multiple of those, but you still have those front-end monoliths. You still have those things where five, six, ten, dozens of teams contribute to. And 
that doesn't really scale with huge organizations. So the promises of microservices, can teams really work autonomously in a front-end monolith? Of course not. They have to coordinate their efforts. They have to talk with each other. Mixing different technology stacks, well, not only due to that coordination, this is really difficult. What if one of those contributing teams really prefers vanilla CSS over less because, I don't know, because they like to type more? Or, or they want to use TypeScript over JavaScript because they like types more? I don't know. Good luck introducing such a change into a huge code base that is contributed to by five, six, or ten different teams. Usually there is resistance because not everyone likes types or typing. And independent release cycles? It's also not going to happen. We, for example, had multiple occasions where a team had finished a feature and wanted to roll out that feature, but couldn't because the microservice itself was currently in a broken state, releases were on hold, first the release had to be fixed again, and then the feature could be rolled out. This is frustrating if you have to wait days before your feature can see the, the light of the world, or even weeks sometimes. It was never weeks in my time, but who knows. So there really is a dirty little secret about microservices and front end. The front enders are somehow left in the rain. Um, it's almost like microservices don't really belong into the front end. When we realized that, we, we kind of took a step back and we asked ourselves, can we do better? Can we do better and maybe build an architecture that provides most of the benefits or maybe even all of the benefits to front end developers? An architecture, a system that scales to dozens or maybe even hundreds of teams, that was actually what our managers brought to us. We want a thing, we want a front end that scales to hundreds of teams. So far they haven't delivered those hundreds of teams, but well, okay. And all of that with a high degree of autonomy that still keeps the bigger picture in mind, that still ends up in an application that doesn't look like a terrible patchwork to the customer. I don't think we found the perfect solution, but we found a solution that works to the constraints that we had and to the requirements that we have for our organization. And we call our solution Mosaic. Mosaic as in small individual pieces that form a beautiful whole picture. The name is also a reference to the NCSA Mosaic browser. Who here remembers the Mosaic browser? Cool. The Mosaic browser is what popularized the web, and we, we hope to take that and push it a little further, even if only a tiny bit. Um, if you want to learn more after my talk, we have a website where we kind of also detail the, the basics of Mosaic, we link talks that we give about it, slides. Um, that 9 in the URL is not a typo, it is actually there, that is another reference. Anyone used Plan 9 ever? Ever heard of Plan 9? <laughs> Same guy, cool. Um, anyway, Mosaic is basically, you can think about it as an architecture that introduces three core concepts. First, there is a thing that we call a fragment. It's easiest to think about a fragment as a microservice, a plain old microservice that returns partial HTML markups. Fragments are owned by teams, like classical microservices are owned by teams, and there is no clear one-to-one -one relationship between teams and fragments. But in general, a team should take care of a small number of independent fragments. Uh, you could think of a fragment like, for example, the header of a page, the navigation of a page, uh, the shopping cart of the page. Those things could be fragments. And there is no communication between fragments directly, and also fragments don't nest, which somehow would be communication between fragments. But fragments themselves talk to APIs, to microservices. And it is highly advisable that fragments don't have any business logic. Business logic belongs into the API layer. The concern of a fragment is rendering and rendering logic alone. This is usually these days enough of a concern for a microservice. Um, what else do I want to say here? Okay, um, those fragments, they are not a complete part, uh, not a complete page. To have a complete page, we need multiple fragments and we need to somehow assemble those fragments. And that is the second thing that Mosaic introduces. That is what we call the layout service. The layout service sits in front of all the fragments and it collects the fragment responses and assembles those things into a complete page. Which fragments go into a page that is configured by a thing that we call a template, because it basically is that. And templates are also owned by teams. They are not necessarily owned by the teams that own the fragments. So it is completely thinkable that a team creates a template that is absolutely only assembled by fragments of other teams. Um, yeah. 
to form a beautiful mosaic. So far we have the pieces, we have basically the bigger picture in mind, but everything would fall down. We still need some glue in between to, to have that thing hold. So we need a mapping of incoming requests to templates, to, to the layout servers. We need something to handle AJAX calls. AJAX calls in general don't return markup, but JSON these days, so they shouldn't go to a fragment, but they should directly go to, to other APIs. So for that thing, the third part of the mosaic architecture is required. It's the router. The router sits in front of all of this, and every customer request, every browser request, first hits the router. The router, again, is configured by route configurations that are updatable at runtime. And it looks at every incoming request and determines, is this an AJAX call? Oh, yes. Well, then, let's send it directly to an API. No, it is a page request. Then let's send it to the layout service. The layout service then looks, OK, I have a template for that thing. Cool. I need five fragments to render that thing. It makes the five fragments calls in parallel, collects the responses, creates a page, and sends that back. Um, yeah. We, or my team, created the router and the layout service, and the fragments are to be created by the individual feature teams. Of course, we gave those things names. Our router is called Skipper, and our layout service is called Taylor. They are both open source. The source is on GitHub, and I'll get into them a little bit more in the next few minutes. But at a very high level, everything that comes into the Mosaic architecture always first hits the router. The router then decides what to do with this thing, and if it's a page request, it gives it to the layout service. The layout service, again, looks at that request, decides what to do with it, asks the fragments. The fragments probably ask some APIs to get the data to do the rendering, like what is in the current um, customer's wish list, what page are we to have a navigation, renders those fragments, sends them back to the layout service, that one assembles a page, and sends it back to the browser. Um, when we started that thing in small scale, the routes and the templates were coming directly from the file system. When it grew, we realized we needed some more control, access control, distribution, and so on. So we also created APIs for those things. For the routes, it's named Innkeeper. For the templates, it's named Kilt. But this is really an implementation detail. This is nothing specific to the Mosaic architecture. Mosaic really is those three things, a router, a layout service, and fragments. And I'm going to go into each of them in a little bit more detail now. First, the router. As I said, our router is named Skipper. You can think of Skipper as a mostly transparent request proxy. Um, it looks at every incoming request and might modify that thing and then ship it to a different endpoint. Um, usually, those endpoints where it ships it to are either APIs or layout services, but there are also requests that Skipper answers directly. So, for example, if Skipper realizes that thing is just a redirect, there's no endpoint to make a redirect. Skipper will just send a redirect response. Um, due to the fact that Skipper is in front of everything, it, is also, it provides some basic security features. It's not a web application firewall or anything, but since it is the entry point into the system, it is the only point that needs DDoS protection. Um, for us, it conveniently terminates XSRF protection. Um, since every AJAX call goes there, we don't have any trouble with cross-origin problems. We don't have to set any cross-origin headers or something like that. And um, since every request goes through that thing, possible encryption cookies, when we want to set an encrypted cookie to the client, all the keys are only stored in Skipper. So we might have 100 teams, but those teams don't know the secret to encrypting and decrypting our cookies. So we have a little bit of security in depth here. Um, to keep latency down, Skipper fully supports streaming of requests and responses. So it's not buffering, storing forward, but everything streams through that thing. Um, for us, Skipper easily handles our peak load of nearly yeah, 7,500 to 8,000 requests per second without breaking too much into sweat. Um, if you're interested, as I said, Skipper is on GitHub. It's written in Go, and it's also extensible in Go. And the flexibility that we get with Skipper provides us one really cool, neat trick. Um, since all incoming requests go through Skipper first, and Skipper puts them either to an API or to a product, we can do something else. We also have our legacy app. By the way, in the process of creating this, we also named our legacy app. It's named Jimmy. So from now on, when I say Jimmy, I mean our legacy app. I can highly recommend naming your legacy app. It gives you an enemy to talk about. So we, we kind of like Jimmy because Jimmy makes us a lot of money or made us a lot of money, but we think it's time for Jimmy to go into retirement. Anyway, 
Skipper can take requests and Skipper can also just route them directly to Jimmy. From the point of Skipper, Jimmy is more or less just another layout service. It returns a complete page. So this gives us a super cool migration path from our legacy app to the new system. Feature by feature, page by page, we can slowly roll out a new architecture. And when something goes wrong, we can just change the route and go back to the old system. We can slowly increase traffic until something breaks and we can go back to the old system. Well, hopefully nothing breaks, but still, having that way back, instead of a huge big bang migration, is uh, really good on your mental health. Trust me about that thing. I can sleep at night because I know if something terribly goes wrong, we can still roll it back. Um, let me quickly show you how we configure the routes in Skipper. Um, we created a domain-specific language for that, that is declarative. Can you read it? Yeah. Oh, there should be some colors up there. Anyway, um, a route is always consistent of a human readable ID so that we have some context to a route. We know roughly why it was created. And then a route has one or more predicates. Predicates in the sense that they look at a request and they return a Boolean value. And all predicates of a route must match for that route to be chosen. Um, the most predicates win, so the most specific route always wins. After the predicate, a route contains of zero or more filters. Filters are used to change the request and the response. As I said, Skipper can automatically handle redirects, for example. Those happen all in filters. And at the end, every route has exactly one endpoint. Routes do not branch. There is no complex logic. You cannot create loops or anything except on an HTTP level. So what this gives us is simple and fast routes that are usually easy to understand. The predicates out of the box come with everything that could be interesting to HTTP. You could ask for headers, you could ask for path, you could ask for host, you could ask for cookies to be set, something like that. And if you need something special, there is one Go interface that you can extend or implement and you have your own predicates. For example, we created some custom ones that are not part of the open source skipper that help us deal the mobile apps traffic from our applications differently in a convenient way. Filters, as I said, they modify the request and they modify the response. You can think of them kind of like a middleware that sits in between. Every request and every response goes through those and they have a chance to modify them. Again, pretty easy to extend them and go. Um, Skipper comes with some of them out of the box, for example, for static file handling, for saying status codes, um, redirecting. Not all of them always make sense in combination, so setting a redirect and overwriting the status code is probably a stupid idea but it would be possible. We realized that those filters, they are much more specific to the actual use case. So Skipper doesn't come with that many out of the box, but we created quite a few that are specific to our use case for handling our customer cookies and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, just some ideas. You could use Skipper directly as an API gateway. Um, we have filters that uh, turns Skipper into an OAuth proxy. So we have a filter where you can set an OAuth scope. And yeah, Skipper makes a call to the OAuth service, validates the token that comes in with the request, things like that. We can use Skipper for weighted traffic control. You can have a filter that basically, or a predicate in that case, that says 30% of the traffic go to this route. And then you need another route that catches the other 70% of the traffic, things like that. Um, you could use Skipper, the Skipper filter as a compression proxy in the middle to compress your responses to save bandwidth. The flexibility that we achieve with Skipper is one of the key advantages of Mosaic and that allow us really to quickly move into different directions. And since we have that API for setting the routes, the teams can completely autonomously change them themselves. When a team comes up with a new idea, they just create their own routes in the system and suddenly on the main Zalando page, their feature is live. There is no communication involved. They don't have to ask us for permission. They can just make their API calls. We have some security there in place that the team cannot accidentally break another team's features. But in general, teams can do whatever they want there. Before I go into the layout service, I want to say a little bit about fragments. I can't really introduce something in fragments because really there isn't that much to it. The feature teams have to build them themselves but there is a very thinly defined protocol that the fragments talk to the layout service. And I think it makes sense to go into that first before introducing the layout service. Fragments are really just plain old microservices. Has anyone used plain old microservices before, like in POMS? POMS? 
Pojos, I don't know, Play Note microservices in the sense that they are HTTP endpoints and they return HTML and they return partial HTML. Partial means usually there is no head, there is no body, it usually just starts with a diff. And all other communication and fragments is really just based on HTTP and based on headers. Usually, Skipper adds some headers and the layout service might also add some headers. Headers that Skipper, for example, could add is the customer number. Skipper takes that from the encrypted customer cookie, knows it, attaches it as a header to the request, so the fragment doesn't have to make a lookup to some database, but already knows this is customer number, so this and that with that name. Um, yeah. Also, the original URL, since the fragments are pretty far down in the hierarchy behind the Skipper and the layout service, we provide the original unmodified URL in there so that, for example, the fragment that renders the product detail can still look at that URL and determine which product to actually show. Um, but there is no specially defined protocol or anything. It really is just HTTP and some headers that you can customly define in your organization. Uh, in Mosaic, we encourage early flushing of headers. So whenever you have your headers ready, flush them, because this allows Mosaic some cool optimization tricks. For example, fragments can declare their required JavaScript and CSS files in link headers. Those are standard headers in the HTTP protocol. And then the layout service can look at those headers and already make the browser fetch those resources before the actual fragment response is there. So maybe your fragment is slow, it takes 200 milliseconds, and we still wait for the content for your HTML to come, but we can already load the JavaScript and the CSS that you might need if you tell it to us in an early flushed header. Um, yeah, that's all there is to say about it. HTTP with headers in, HTML with headers out. That's all a fragment is. Uh, the real magic of putting it all together, that happens in the layout service. Our layout service is called Taylor because it makes beautiful suits, I don't know. <laughs> um, and it is the central piece, the hard piece of the mosaic architecture. It is the thing that creates the complete pages and it is absolutely critical to achieve good performance. It parallelizes the fragment requests, it streams responses to the client, and um, it uses streaming all over the place to, to keep latency as, as low as possible. Um, it also generates some client-side code, so uh, if a fragment is an actual small application, like a React application, that thing will trigger the initialization of that thing. Um, our tailor is written in Node.js, which is not that important for the Mosaic thing, but it shows that we have some pretty hardcore JavaScript wizards in our team. I only contributed minor things to that, but it is an amazing piece of engineering. Um, Originally, Taylor was inspired by a thing that Facebook introduced about two years ago named BigPipe, which the basic idea of BigPipe is you have your page that is composed of different things, and they stream all to the client in the order that they are ready. There was a time where you could really see a Facebook page pop up block by block. Um, that naive approach of just streaming to the page whenever something is ready, that had some shortcomings when we looked into it that were really not acceptable to us. One of the biggest shortcomings is what if a page request is not supposed to be a 200? I guess this doesn't really happen at Facebook, but for us, that is a real use case. If you go to an article that is out of stock, we might want to redirect you to the brand of that article. So to show you, if you're looking for a specific Nike shoe, that Nike shoe isn't there, we might want to show you other Nike shoes. And for SEO reasons, we might want to do that with a proper redirect. So in our system, who should be, control, who should be in charge of that redirect? Who owns that redirect? Um, we thought about it, and we think the only place that really should know about that redirect is whatever comes under that product fragment, so the services underneath that thing. So our solution to that thing is that every template in Taylor can have exactly or up to one primary fragment. And that primary fragment is treated specially. If a template contains a primary fragment, everything is halted until that primary fragment has flushed its headers. Again, a reason to have early header flushing. Those headers contain the status code of the primary fragment. And if the primary fragment says 302, then that whole thing will be a 302. Um, apart from that, there's not that much special about the primary. Um, everything else is flushed to the browser in the order it is ready or in the order it appears in the template. That is actually something that we can choose in Mosaic. And that is all configured in the template. Templates are basically HTML. They look something like this. So in the template, you have the HTML head, the HTML body. You have some common things like title, meta tags, 
Here in this case, they come from a one fragment, then you have a fragment that renders the header, and then you have that primary fragment that I was just talking about, and you could also tag a fragment as async. A fragment that is tagged as async behaves exactly like in the big pipe approach. There's only a placeholder rendered in the page, and whenever the response stream comes from the fragment, it goes directly to the browser and is put in place in, via JavaScript. So on a template by template situation, we can decide if we want more a big pipe approach or more uh, assemble everything on a server approach. This also gives us cool flexibilities. We can override that again with some headers. So for example, if a search bot comes from which we know that thing can't actually execute JavaScript, we could ignore all the async and render a complete page on the server. And but the crawler gets a complete page instead of some weird JavaScript that it would need to evaluate. Also, older clients where we might realize they don't support the JavaScript that we are doing, we could send them a completely server-side assembled page. And for more modern, faster clients, we can assemble everything on the client and therefore have way faster renderings. Um, Taylor also supports things for um, higher level templating, so like a base template. Usually at a company you have common boilerplates that is there in every template. Every header will look like this, every page will have a footer with an imprint. So for those, for those things there is a higher level template, we call it base template, that's not shown here. And there is also, um, there are facilities for error handling. So for example, if we know the header fragment is sometimes kind of flaky because they use a weird new technology, um, we can configure a timeout and a fallback. So in this case, if the header doesn't manage to respond within 500 milliseconds, we make a second request to the fallback. In our case, most of the fallbacks actually go to an HTML file that lies in an S3 bucket. Partial HTML file in an S3 bucket, incidentally, is a perfectly valid fragment. It's HTTP and you get some HTML back. No magic involved. And the uptime of S3 buckets is really impressive. So for things like the header, if they are down, we can render a static header that at least allows basic navigation. And yeah, this adds a lot of resilience to the whole system. Um, this basically concludes my short overview over the mosaic architecture, over fragments, over router, and over the layout service. And the result of all this, well, we hope to our customers, it makes no difference at all except that the page loads faster, the perceived performance is higher, but it still should look like a beautiful, coherently designed Zalando fashion store page. Um, the pages that we already migrated to the new architecture, the time to first byte and the time to first meaningful render both drastically improved because the slow parts are moved into their own fragment and don't drag the whole page down. But in general, it all looks and feels like the old fashion store page. So for the user, everything should be invisible. So even fragments can be invisible. Not all fragments have to render visible markups. We have in every page a base assets fragment and a tracking fragment that does some user tracking to track the user journey. And the base assets contains a base component library, in our case with React.js components that provide a coherent style and also some CSS so that all buttons look the same. A very minimal JavaScript environment something that fragments can rely on. This is part of every page and that's an invisible fragment that is there. And for us developers, for us front-end developers, well, for us the result is really cool. We have huge improvements on all the three problem areas that I described earlier. We can innovate way faster. We can, at runtime, inject new features and take them out within seconds. We have way faster feedback loops. We are completely tech agnostic. We, whenever we hear of a cool new technology, we can make a small spike make a fragment out of it and put it on the page. Um, I think we even have a fragment that is written in Elm, for example. And on the productivity side, we give teams full end-to-end -end responsibility. They have full control over their page, over their part of the page. And while doing that, we minimize risk. They cannot accidentally break the whole shop. They can only break what belongs to them. This is exactly the amount of autonomy that you want to give a team. The team is responsible for a feature. The team can break that feature, but the team cannot break the whole thing. Of course, in the browser, there are caveats. You don't really have sandboxing in the browser. If they render out broken HTML or decide to completely drop the whole DOM, of course, everything breaks. But in general, they only break their own parts. Um, this allows the teams their own lean, agile processes. They have independent development. They have continuous delivery. Teams can 
redeploy as often as they want, as long as they maintain zero downtime deployments. We have some teams that really have full continuous development, uh, deployment. They deploy their fragments 10, 20, 30 times a day. Every commit to master deploys the fragment. And we have some teams that are still a little bit more cautious. And also on growth, that whole system isn't really that complex. It's easy to explain to people. We don't have to explain our huge legacy application. And when the cool new technology comes up, we can use that in a fragment. So we are also a magnetic employer. We can say, come to us. You can work with TypeScript. Come to us. You can work with the newest version of React.js. And we can actually hold that promises. And if new ideas come, new feature ideas, we can easily spin off new teams and let them create their own things. Um, before I come to end, I would like to give you a short demonstration of how this all looks in practice. OK, let's hope this works. I'll switch to mirroring for that so that I see what you see. This is probably not readable. Is this roughly readable? Cool. OK. Um, starting, the Zalando legacy application would take longer than my talk, so that's not really an option. But I created a fake legacy application. Let me see if that starts up. So. Oh, do we get a mainframe link? Yes, we have a mainframe link. OK. Our legacy application is actually terribly slow, as you can see here. And it's a rubber duck store. You can see it's old and legacy because it's from the time when Comic Sans was a good idea in web development. But it has everything you need. It has a header. It has a catalog. It has a product page. It's ridiculously slow. It has product picture you can buy. And it has this weird slow feature that some product people came up. No one really knows why it's there, but it is the slow feature that really takes down the whole page. So let's use Skipper to take that thing over and slowly replace that thing with the mosaic architecture. For that, we need Skipper first, and we need a route. First of all, we only need one simple route. Every request that comes in goes to the legacy service. So. Readable. So we have an any, an any predicate that just matches for any request. There's also a shortcut for that thing. And it goes to the legacy application. Um, starting skipper is as easy as calling it. It outputs the routes that are detected, and then it gives you an access log. In a real system, we would now take our DNS record and point it to Skipper. But since I don't have a DNS on my local machine, we have to fiddle a little bit with ports. But as you can see, the thing is listening on port 9090. So if we now go to port 9090, nothing has changed. It is still the same old slow shop. It still perfectly works. But it is painfully slow. The only thing that really changes is if you look at the response headers, it actually says powered by Skipper. OK, we didn't really win anything here. So let's create some fragments. Let's create a layout service. And let's hook those things up. I'll take over that product page. So our team has decided we want to turn it into three fragments. We have the header fragment, we have the product fragment, and we have the weird slow fragment. No one really knows what it's doing, but it has to be on the page. OK, so a few hours of development later, we have a header fragment. We start it. We have a product fragment. We start it. And we have that weird slow fragment. Um, again, normally, this would happen more with DNS. I'll have to do, deal with ports. And during the creation of this talk, I learned something really interesting. Does anyone look at the ports? This one listens on 5,000. This one listens on 7,000. This one listens on 6,006. Does anyone have a guess why that is? It's not taken. 6,000 is considered by Chrome as an insecure port. Chrome has a list of ports that it blocks by default. 6,000 is one of those, usually because it is taken by some other applications to not accidentally hit an IMAP server or something like that. But I wasn't aware of that. Interesting catch. OK. If we now call one of those fragments, let's call this hollow one. Um, HTTP, localhost, 6,006. 
and um, slow, we see it is slow, and it returns some markup. It wants to use some CSS for something. It doesn't early flush the headers, but that is not a requirement, just a recommendation. Okay, so next, let's have a template. I prepared something to not type all that out. This is a very base template. Let's give it a little bit more space. You can see there is a header. It still uses the legacy CSS from before. Um, to take over some styles, then it uses the header fragment, it uses the slow feature fragment, and it uses the product details fragment. Now what we need is a route to actually hit that thing, or let's start it first. Starting that thing, as I said, it's written in Node. Um, it is currently configured to load its template just from the file system in the templates folder. And running that thing, when everything is running good, uh, Taylor is a very quiet man. He just sits there and serves out responses. So, uh, by default, it listens on port 8080. So, let's create a route that hits that thing. Um, I also, in that route, introduced a filter just to show you what they are doing. I'm setting a response header that maybe our tracking team can use to determine which performs better, the old world or the new world. But the previous product page, um, it's listening on the URL duck, is now taken over by a more specific route. Path is more specific than the catch-all route, and it will go to the layout service. Um, when running Skipper from the pure file system, sadly there is no auto hot reloading, so I'll have to quickly stop it and start it again. But it supports other sources for the routes that are updated at runtime. So it detected two routes, it's up. And now when we go to the home, it is still slow, it is still the old stop shop. But when we go to the best dot ever, ooh, there is something. The header is fast. And it's not a legacy application anymore. It's using Futura now. It's the design of the future. Um, but as you see, the product still takes a while because the slow feature comes first in the template. And it's blocking everything out. Let me quickly show you. Duck is now coming from the new world. And when I go back to the home, that is coming from the old world. So, what can we do? As I said, quick change in the template, we just make the slow feature async. Um, should be a quick fix. Save. And if we reload the page now, page is fast, just a slow feature, takes a while until it is streamed to the client and put in place. This is already a huge improvement. And now that we have this cool technology, we can hire new people. We can put them in the slow feature team. And those new people have, might have heard of radical new technologies, like, for example, Ajax. We can make that slow feature load by Ajax so that it's even cooler and doesn't appear out of nothing. So a little bit of development time goes on. And what they built is, do I have my curl? They built a slow Ajax fragment that just outputs a placeholder. And they build an API that returns the actual slow part. Now we need to put that in. Or they, the team could do that themselves. They go to their template, and they say, from now on, we want to call slow Ajax. But they also need a route for the API request in Skipper. So they also go to the route definition. And they say slow API is everything that comes in through API slow. And that thing should hit localhost, should hit their slow thing on port 6006. So again, sadly, I'll have to restart Skipper, but it is fast in restarting, and when we reload the page now, we see the loading thing, and after we have initialized the slow feature, it comes up on the page. 
This is the basics of how you can have a legacy application, take it over with Mosaic, and incrementally update it without putting the rest of the page at risk. And this also concludes my short demo. If you have any questions, now is the time. Otherwise, enjoy your lunch. Hi. Hi. Uh, what uh, mechanism do you use for uh, encapsulation of fragments? On the page? Yeah. <laughs> to don't uh, have the leaking of uh, things out of them. We experimented with some cool and creative ideas, but in the end uh, we had to ditch them because the browsers that we want to support, in this case namely some Android browser versions, weren't fast enough to support them. We tried a version where every fragment was running in its own uh, web worker and getting basically a mirror of the DOM and if it would crash, it would only crash that web worker and it could only modify the part of the DOM that it actually owns. But web workers are not yet fast enough, so we had to roll that back. We will investigate that periodically. So far, it really only is, uh, we hope teams do it right. We uh, lock client-side errors and if someone actually screws something up, the team has to fix it. There is no real isolation or sandboxing in the client. Yeah, really. Uh, you have leaking of CSS, for example. Uh, for that, we, um, we use techniques like BAM to have no global uh, selectors, and we have a validation step that looks for global selectors and flags them. We, we're not rejecting those, but it triggers an alarm, and we can go to the teams and tell them, that's not a good idea. You're going to break something else. Um, hi. Hi. I uh, like the idea. Um, how about these uh, links, link headers you sent? They can kind of match nicely to HTTP2, HTTP2 push promises. So how about HTTP2 in your setup? Yes, uh, that is where we are currently working on. Um, Zalando currently deploys to AWS. And only since the ELB version 2, the application load balancer that was publicly available for, I think, a month, Amazon supports HTTP2. So we are now trying to make that HTTP2 more or less transparent to the teams. We will take them and move them into push promises on the front end. But that is ongoing work. That is not yet live. Uh, one question regarding router. How yes. would you uh, support multiple environments? Support what? Uh, multiple environments. Like you have a development, production, staging for testing, and mm -hmm. etc. Currently, we actually have two instances of Skipper running, but we are not happy with that setup. One alternative is to have, for example, a predicate that looks for a specific cookie environment development, and with that you could easily split routes in between two. So have routes that only hit when you have that cookie, or send a header along, depending on how hard or easy you want to make it. That is a better approach that we want to go to. But right now, we have two environments. And that's a bit painful, because the route definitions drift apart. Also, the, the idea of having a predicate or a cookie for testing gives you kind of the what if option. You could first inject a route with a predicate of a special cookie. Then you go there with your cookie. You see that it actually works the way you want. And if it works, you just change the route to not have that cookie anymore. Cool. Um, yeah, contact me if you're interested in more details or look at the techzalando.com blog. Uh, we also document our advances there. And enjoy your lunch. Thanks for your attention.